Now, today is a bit more of a niche angle. We try and support people who have the potential to go on and do amazing things in society, but normally kind of get missed along the way. So we'll definitely be tackling that. All right, well, let's do the introductions then. So I'm Nat, and I am the head of community at an organization called Exceptional Individuals. We are a social enterprise based in the UK, and we support adults, normally 16 and above, in dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, and any of the other neurodivergence. Essentially, neurodivergence is just thinking differently to the mainstream. And we are going to be looking about how that fits in to the education world from secondary to college to sort of sixth form to university and beyond. Because uh, there are different nuances. And to be honest, our job would be a lot easier if people had the right support earlier on in life, because we mainly work with people going into the working world. Now, a little bit more of what we do is we also help with recruitment, so helping get neurodiverse talent into high-end jobs, particularly interesting if any of you are at university now. We do training, consultancy, our audits, you know, with anything related to being neurodiverse so that you are eventually going into the workplace or supporting people going off into work get involved because we're a completely free organization to individuals and we work with corporates which help fund us. What makes us particularly unique is our lovely team here are 80% neurodiverse. So we're experts by experience. And today you're gonna to be taught by myself who is also very much dyslexic and did get help throughout my entire education journey, which I'm really grateful for. How good the, the support was varies a lot. So dyslexia in 16 plus education. Now, this looks like this will be relevant for most of you, but even if you support people who are pre-16, eventually they are going to get to this stage. And it used to be that if before 16 and after 16 would like kind of different, whole different ball games when it came to dyslexia, because you need a pre-diagnostic and a, and a post one. But thankfully, you only need one diagnosis to forever now. But there are a few instances where that might be enough and what counts as official proof. So we'll be getting, getting a bit more into that. Now, as I mentioned, today's deep dive is we're going to be looking at further education, which is essentially college and apprenticeships and sixth form, higher education, which is university, a couple of study skills which can help you if you are in education, and also how you can find a tutor or someone to give you additional support, which is invaluable if you're able to do that. So first of all, the Equality Act 2010. If you're in the UK, we've got you covered. If you're not in the UK, normally there's some equivalent schemes. But in the UK, we have the Act, which essentially says anyone with a recognised disability is protected um, from discrimination in theory. Now you might be thinking, but nah, dyslexia, is it really a disability? Well, what is the definition of disability? It's something which has a medium to severe um, impact on your day-to-day -day life that is, has been around for about six to 12 months or more. Well, dyslexia is every single day of your life and you're born with it, you die with it. So yes, it is a disability. And you may not see it as a disability, and that's completely fine. But when it comes to getting support and making sure that the education system is doing their job, absolutely use this, throw the book at them. And it's a really good thing to know about. So we're going to begin with further education. So just to remind you, that's essentially college, sixth form apprenticeships. And there is support available. It does vary in quality and also it's not completely equal. So you'll notice that one of your friends will be able to get support in education and someone else who has seemingly the very set kind of characteristics will not be able to get the same amount of support. It's a bit unfair, but there are like ways which you can increase the likelihood that you can get support. 
So first of all, I want to ask you, do you need a formal diagnosis in order to get support in college? So I've clicked yes for yes, or no for no. OK, so we've got yeah. Now, this is an interesting one. So to get certain support, yes, you do. And it's a shame, really, because in the rest of your life, you do not need formal support. For instance, when you're in the world of work, regardless of being diagnosed or not, you do not need any proof. And in universities, you typically can get support whether or not you have a formal diagnosis or not. Now, the amount of support you can get obviously varies. The more higher needs you have, the greater level of support. But there is normally people, there are always services available on the whole. College, though, they require a higher level. Now, the key word here is a formal diagnosis, because not all diagnoses are created equal. So you've got to make sure if you're thinking about getting an assessment done beforehand, just make sure it's one that they recognize. It's a bit of the Wild West out there when it comes to finding recognized people who can diagnose multiple sets of conditions, differences, whatever you want to call it. That does not mean, though, that if you do not, if you are not diagnosed, there isn't still support available, but it will mean getting free help does become a bit more difficult. So we are going to be looking into that and the limitations and the pros. Personally, I think if you are under 18, getting diagnosed can be a massive benefit. It just saves a lot of headache. But when you're over 18, the benefit in an ideal world, if you're in a good employer, maybe it's not as beneficial and it's more for like a personal reason. Now on here, I just want to ask you, and I'm assuming some of you probably have, have you heard of any of these terms? Sen, Send or Senco? These are always terms that I always used to hear thrown around like, oh, Nathaniel Senko. I was like, what's that? But these are your go-to people, particularly in either secondary or college, where the people you'd want to go to for support. And they've, they've got different names and different um, like abbreviations, depending where you go. So I'm mainly putting this here just to keep an eye out. So let's say you move to a new location and you're like, this place has no support. Remember, there's multiple names which basically mean the same thing. Oh, Martha from Greece. Nice to have you. So to break down the terms, SEND is Special Education Needs and Disabilities. Nice and inclusive. It, it holds a whole lot. And if you notice here, it has disabilities. And I think that's why people use this a bit more. So it's a bit more all encompassing. Um, SEND, however, is probably one that you'll see a bit more often. Special Education Needs. They're basically the same thing. You, you could you say that um, you might have two different departments, but a lot of places will just have one or the other. I think it just depends on like personal preference. But, you know, feel free to uh, call me out on that if you think it's a bit different where you are. And a Senco or a Sendco is essentially the person who supports those two demographics. So it's a special education needs and disability coordinator. It might be the person who is like, you could say like a support teacher or a specialist or the person you would go to about getting support. They might be the people that help you in exams. It really varies. And I see Martha, who's from Greece. Some of the things I say today might not be completely accurate in terms of Greece, but if you know the equivalent, feel free to let me know. But there will definitely be a similar thing where you are. So now we know some of the terms and they're important to know to look out for, because if you just say, oh, do you have a dyslexia tutor or someone who specializes in neurodiversity, the reception or whoever you're talking to might not have a clue. But if you use the correct terms, you're probably going to get to the right person a little bit quicker. You tend not to use these terms when you get into either university or employment Special education, I think that term's falling out of favorable view just because special and not everyone likes that. So I think people are moving around, but still very much used uh, at the moment. Now, if you are dyslexic, please answer. Or if you're not dyslexic and you help people with dyslexia, I'd like to know when you have first noticed people receiving support. 
So did you first get support in school, primary, education, university, or never? Okay, interesting. Now, it's really good, interesting to know because the earlier you're able to get support, the easier it is to get support in every other stage of your life. Because what they're normally looking for is essentially proof that you do need this help and you need to kind of build up a case. Uh, so let's say you're in college and you want 25% extra time in an exam. Well, ha if you do not have an official diagnosis, it makes it a lot harder, but not impossible. But if you've had support in secondary school and support in primary school, you're building up kind of a good set of proof or a foundation that you would benefit. And this is why it really is important to get as much help as early on as possible. Oh, Martha says, all this is new for me. I'm trying to learn as much as possible about dyslexia because I've been teaching children with dyslexia for the last two years. Well, it's great to have you. Now, another thing to say about when people first get support is that it does vary a lot. And unfortunately, a lot of people do not get it. There's more support when you're younger, I think, because there's more funding available for it. It does come down to that. But then when it comes to universities, this is a good opportunity to actually do your research and find out what they have available, because you normally get a lot more choice then. And I'll tell you, it was one of the biggest things I did when deciding where to go. I went to Bournemouth University because they had really good support for those with dyslexia. And that was more important for me than maybe other factors. So interestingly, we've got a nice mix here and a nice uh, all rounder. Now, if any of you did receive support, I'd really like to know what support you received, because as I mentioned, it is really wide and different for everyone. Uh, for me, I think in primary school, I had one to one support with reading, which was really needed. Secondary school, I had extra time in my exams and I think I had to go see a Senko like every couple of weeks just to check in. That's probably as much as my support went. College, I had someone I could see weekly who could help me with spelling, grammar, comprehension. And university, that's where the money kicked in and I was able to get reading equipment, even a computer. But, but getting a computer these days is a lot harder than it used to be. Okay, we've got a note taker at uni. Yes, note takers are very popular. And it could either be a digital note taker, so someone who, well, a computer that just dictates it or a physical person. Support for autism, nice. And I just wanna quick mention that. So my, my version is quite interesting. So remember how I said earlier on, it used to be quite different in the world of education where if you had a report saying you were dyslexic before 16, it basically wasn't valid post 16. And that was a real bummer that it, it made life very difficult. And as such, I was, I was dyslexic, but officially I was not dyslexic, which means I couldn't get the support. But because I'm officially also diagnosed with autism and that is a lifelong condition and it didn't expire at any particular age, I was still able to get special education support. So that is, a, that is a bit of a loophole. But if you have another thing recognized and diagnosed, you might be able to still get support via that. Okay, we've got extra time in exams or exams instead of written. Nice. Mentoring at uni, extra time. Okay, brilliant. Okay, Ellie says, access to work funded me to have a reduced teaching timetable when moving from NQT to fully qualified teacher. I also got a laptop and software. No, that's brilliant. And access to work, for those of you who do not know, is a government scheme which can support those with recognised disabilities under the Equality Act, which, as we said, dyslexia does count, to get additional support and funding. Really great. Now, there is this similar scheme, like uh, in universities, but colleges and secondary schools, they tend to be more like universal, like the schools will be given like a big sack of cash. Well, not a big cat, a tiny cat, sack of cash and said, use this to support your students rather than individually support. So moving on to Hello Kitty for some reason, what can support look like? So a lot of you have said it already, but these are some of the most common ones. So a use of assistive technology. What is assistive technology? 
It's just anything that can make your life easier. So maybe you, in an exam, you might be allowed noise cancelling headphones to help you concentrate. It might be that you're allowed like a coloured overlay to help you read paper easier. It might be that you can get thing, your exam paper printed out on bigger print or kind of tinted yellow paper. It could be a note taker. It could be a, um, a pen that you scan over things that it reads back to you. The key thing when it comes to this sort of equipment is they do not like to give you things which you can use elsewhere in your life. So if you, for instance, get a pen which reads things back, which can only basically be used for that purpose, nice and easy. But if you want, say, a computer, it's more difficult because obviously you can go on Netflix, you can, like, you can do whatever you want. I'm not saying other things are impossible, but it's a lot easier to get support for things which can only be used for that particular reason. Now on to actual exams. What support can be available? And we've all heard of the classic 25% extra time, but that isn't an official rule. It's the most average amount of time that people are often given to you know, have more time to process information, to think about, but it honestly, it can be a lot longer. And it all depends on your needs and what conditions you have. For dyslexia, you could get 25%. That's probably what you're going to get. But if you think that isn't going to be enough for you, you can put that case forward. So any idea what we mean by EAAs? Have a think of what it might stand for. It's an important term to know, particularly if you're looking to get further support. If you have no idea, I'd say take a good guess. Oh, Martha has no idea. To be honest, I really struggle with these things. So I didn't know beforehand. Okay, education adaptive adjustments. The correct, yeah, uh, the correct answer is exam access arrangements. So not too off, not too far off, to be honest. And what exactly is that? It's the official process of getting support. So you can't just rock up to your exam and say, I want support, give it to me. It's a process. You have to do it in advance. They have to get permission. You have to get approval. And they basically have to put their case forward. So as I said earlier, if you are diagnosed, relatively easy. But if you are not diagnosed, not impossible, but the SENCO or teacher or whoever is fighting your case will have to have some sort of proof. I remember we're still talking about further education at the moment, so college and apprenticeships. So if you are dyslexic, you may be eligible to have an EAA. You aren't guaranteed to be eligible, and that is something which some people get really annoyed about when they find out they're not eligible, It because maybe your proof isn't relevant, is out of date, or isn't credible, or there's no evidence of prior support. Discuss your needs in advance. Pretty much the sooner you talk to them that you will need support, the better you, the more likely you'll get it. You honestly cannot leave it to the day before, mostly like a few months before at minimum, or even, even like several months in advance would be better. So honestly, tell someone you could benefit earlier on. I always think if you're entitled to it, it's better to get it and not use it than not get it at all, particularly when it comes to things like extra time. You may need to be assessed to apply to the Joint Council of Qualifications. So this co this council is like the over a, the, like the top one, and then you can get an then you apply for an exam access agreement, and but after that you need to have a diagnosis. So these are the people who can make or break your chances of getting support. It's not down to the teachers um, or the educators, and I think a lot of the time. Uh, students and parents think it's down individually to the schools or colleges. Unfortunately, it's not, particularly if they're a state school rather than uh, private. The JCQ will normally take into account your normal ways of working. So if you've never had a reader or a note taker or additional time before, you're probably not going to get it. And this is another thing. So let's say in your day-to-day -day life, 
you are you know you're going to need support in the exam situations and you don't really feel you need support on the day-to-day lessons it may very well may be worth still trying to get support in your day-to-day education just because it builds up like think of it like a credit rating you know you've got to build up good credit rating in order for a bank to give you a loan it's very similar with this for this exam board and the council, for them to grant you additional privileges, you have to kind of build up a reputation that this is how you would normally work. And all they are doing is enabling you to be your best with what you normally, how you normally are. And uh, so just keep that in mind. For apprenticeships, so it's a little bit different. Rather than having like an overseeing council, it's very much done like individual so the function skills tests are set by relevant exam awarding bodies maybe you're doing like a construction one uh, or you're doing hair and beauty the people you go to are going to be different depending so you know keep that in mind that you probably wouldn't go to the joint council for apprenticeships necessarily now in terms of exam adjustments what do you think would be best for you And I'm not saying what ones have you had previously, but ones you just think would bring the most added benefit. Very interesting. So far, extra time is in the winner. And honestly, I would not have passed without it. I think that is definitely essential one. Reading out loud. That's an interesting one as well, because obviously when you're doing exams, often you're in a big old exam hall. Maybe you want to have your own private office just so you can speak out loud. And the justification for that is it helps you process. Interestingly enough, in history, every um, when you know reading was relatively new, it was common practice to read out loud. And people who read inside their head was just kind of considered a neat party trick. It's only relatively recently where it's been common, like the standard to read inside your head. OK, the private space also nice. Coloured overlays. If any of you are ever wondering why do coloured overlays even help, essentially it just changes the contrast. So it stops things from moving around as much and it helps you stay a bit more focused. A computer reader. This is really good. I had a human reader and to be honest, I found that really cringy. So for me, I would much prefer a computer reader. Pros is independent. You know, you can do it in your own time. Cons, they sound like a robot. Voice recognition software, essentially that allows you to talk and it, to write it out on your behalf, really great. Now, the reason why sometimes these might be harder to get is it depends, like, can you hack it? Can you cheat? Normally you'd have to get specialist software, which has been like programmed to get rid of. I, I remember I was allowed to use Microsoft Word, but they had to go in the settings and deactivate spell check because that part of it wasn't allowed. So as long as the software has different functions where they can turn off things which would go against the rules, then you're typically allowed to use it. And a scribe is just someone who will write for you. So you would talk and they would kind of write it out. Okay, we've got, do they have rest breaks in post 16? Yes, and that's a really good one. I did have rest breaks on here, but then there was just like too many on the list. So you can, for instance, have a little break, pause the clock, That's not necessarily giving you extra time, but it's giving you just a moment to breathe. So that is something that you can ask for. Okay, before I move on to higher education, any questions on uh, college and sixth form and apprenticeships? Am I right in thinking you can still read the questions in rest breaks? Do you know what? I'll be honest with you, I do not know that. Uh, I'm not sure. Are these rest breaks 100%? you just got to have a cup of tea and chill, or are you able to still read? I don't know that. Um, It's a good question though. I think the standard answer would be, it depends on organizations, but maybe there is a particular like official rule. I know you can pre-16. Well, it is possible then, very possible, but I wouldn't like to say uh, completely. Higher education is just the official word for university, but you can do university in colleges. You can do, um, you can even do apprenticeships at different levels. So it doesn't necessarily have to be university, but that's what we typically think of when we use the term 
higher education. Now, with higher education, it really isn't created equal because a lot of the time universities are private. And as such, they have a lot more autonomy. They can kind of choose what they include, what they do not include. And I remember going to a lot of different universities and it just their support wasn't very equal. Some had amazing support and others had terrible support. And it's difficult, particularly if there's a course you really want to do. So a quick question. What questions do you think as a dyslexic or if you know someone who is dyslexic, they should ask a potential university before applying or before accepting a placement? Let's stop thinking about what we should do retrospectively and thinking in advance. Say you're going to an open evening and you got the opportunity to ask a question. What type of things do you think you should ask? First of all, we got what special support am I entitled to? And that's good. I like the word entitled in this scenario, just because it shouldn't be something you have to fight for. It should be something which should be as easy as just ticking a box saying, I would benefit from this support. The style slash form of exams, the overall exams conditions. I like that. Yeah. Will it be multiple choice? Is it going to be like oral? Is it predominantly coursework? Find out if it works for you. For me, I made sure I picked a course that wasn't exam based because that isn't how I thrive. What does support look like at your university? Exactly. Is it one to one support? Is it group support? Do you need? I think another good question is what type of proof do you need, if any? I would say on the whole, universities tend to be a bit better when it comes to not needing proof. But as with many things, the ones who are officially diagnosed do normally get priority. Are there notes or videos of the lectures or just my notes? Really good question, actually. Are the lectures being recorded? A lot of people with dyslexia might find it easier to review things later on and be able to like go back and forth and check the notes. Also, are you allowed to record the sessions yourself? It kind of like how flexible are they with these things? Another question, which I think a lot of people um, may forget about, is the reading materials. Are they done in a, was it OCR, Oct um, which is optical character recognition, something like that? Essentially, you know, when you get a PDF and you can highlight it and essentially you can get your computer to read it back to you, that's a good format. But sometimes you get like flat images and you can't get the computer to read it back to you. For me, that was a deal breaker. I had to make sure that whatever materials they expected us to read, it was in a format that my software was compatible with. So these are a few questions that I came up with. And to be honest, they complement your ones really well. How assistive technology slash additional time are managed? Is this a nice and easy process? If, you do, if I say I need this, will you take my word on it? Or is this something where I have to do a form, a process, fill it in, get approval, get it ticked off? It's good to know you do not want to spend three or four years fighting just to get a, a bit of support. Next, the examination format. And one of you already mentioned that. How is it done? Is it done in a big group hall? Is it done in individual rooms? Is it multiple choice? Is it open ended? Is it coursework based? Really important. Because let's say if it's an exam format, the chance of you getting a reasonable adjustment to make it predominantly coursework based is really slim. Remember, the key word here is reasonable adjustments. They'll make small, just, small changes, but they aren't going to rewrite the entire syllabus just for you. What support is offered for different styles of assessments? What this means is in exam, yeah, you might get extra time, you could get a reader, but if it's, for instance, coursework based, is there other adjustments on that behalf? Is there someone to review your work? Is there someone who can just go over it? Is there people who can help you read, digest the information like before the exam, during and after? That's something which I like to look at. Great. And is consideration made for grammar for neurodivergent learners? That's a really good one as well. Some, some courses, they will grade you for your grammar and spelling. 
others will not take that into consideration. So always look about what's important for them. You may think you're doing a course, I don't know, maybe doing psychology or humanitary, like some course, and you think, well, they should be testing me on the subject and not the spelling. Do not make that assumption. Sometimes marks are given for spelling and grammar. I know for my course, it was only like, I don't know, like 10 points or whatever. It was a really small amount, but they did definitely mark you down if the grammar was bad. And as such, I got a adjustment. So they would take that in consideration. And however many points they would normally deduct for grammar, they did not deduct for myself. And again, that probably made a difference between me getting a 2-1 or getting a 2-2. Last but certainly not least, can deadlines be adjusted so they are staggered? This mainly refers to coursework. You tend not to have as much flexibility when the exams are. But with coursework, let's say they're all together, as long as you give them plenty of notice, they normally can be quite flexible in this. But this is very much a case-by-case -case example. But ask in advance, do not leave it to the last minute because they cannot move mountains for you in the space of a couple of days. All right, I've got a question. My issue is, photographic processing so understanding people with strong accents do you think it's okay to ask on a percent of delivery staff who are eal oh that's a good question you can see how it might be problematic though essentially saying i want someone who has a accent i can understand it's a really really good question but i can see why it's a question which can be very sensitive I don't have an answer to it, to be honest, because it's it's a very sensitive uh, area because you don't want to basically come across like you're discriminating. But also it's a fair point that certain accents can be difficult to understand. I think what you can do is to have some like maybe someone who can support you in lessons and help you with the comprehension and understanding. But I doubt you could get you can request certain accents. I don't think that would be allowed. So yeah, to the answer to your question, I do not think you can ask that, but they might be able to do something on the side. So, or there might be another way of wording it, to be honest. Like, for instance, I like to record uh, the audio and then the audio is translated on the software. Now with heavier accents, the software isn't as effective. Are you able to get someone to help me with the understanding? So I'd say just maybe be a bit more careful on how you word it. But I totally see what you're saying, and uh, a lot of people can struggle with that. We're now on to getting that money, <laughs> because being dyslexic, people might not think about it, but it does cost you more. If you spend extra time doing things, it's going to have a co an effect. So this is when lovely student finance comes in. And this, I must say, is related to the UK and other countries aren't as lucky with their student finance, though I must say ours has gone downhill dramatically. Student Allowance DSA is a grant which you do not have to pay back. So thankfully, it's not going to be part of this massive debt you're carrying, which allows for essential costs to be covered. I remember everyone, no, there used to be this kind of bit of a banter, like joke, but it was also there was a bit of deepness to it under the surface where people would make fun of those with dyslexia for being able to get a computer or a Mac. But I think what people didn't realize is this isn't about an, being, having an advantage with in this regards. It's about leveling the playing field, and making sure you have the equipment you need in order to operate at the same level as your peers. So quick question, true or false? For disabled student allowance, you need an official diagnosis. Oh, nice. 50-50. It is true. And I know I said if universities, it's different. You can get support if you are not diagnosed. But when it comes to getting the funding, yeah, you do. And this is the type of thing you can apply for the funding like in year two or year three if you're still wanting to get diagnosed. But honestly, it's a right hassle. So you want to get it done before you start in an ideal world. Okay, true or false? And hopefully you know, because I've, I've already said this. Diagnostic reports need to be a post-16 assessment. So in order for your assessment to count, it needs to be done 
after you turn 16. And as I see rightly, it is false. This didn't used to be the case. So if you ever hear someone say, oh, well, I did it before I was 16, it's no longer valid. That was true. But I want to say 2013, they changed it. It was around that time when they changed it. So now, even if you were diagnosed at six years old, in theory, it should absolutely still count. Now, here's a quick quote from the BDA, the British Dyslexia Association. And this is about, are assessments free? Because you might think, um, all right, this sounds great now. I want to get this support. But how do I even go about getting an assessment? The best way to get an assessment is through school and primary <laughs> and to get it early on. But if you miss that or you get missed, which unfortunately happens a lot, you might have to pay. So they recommend to check with your disability support officer whether there is financial support available to help fund an assessment. You may have to pay yourself. All they're saying here is, is it's pretty much 80% certain you'll have to pay privately, which is a real shame, but is the truth of the matter. But it's worth asking anyway. For instance, in colleges or universities, sometimes they do have pockets of funding where you can apply for it and you can get it paid for or half paid for. So though I think you should be expecting to pay, I don't think you should automatically assume you have to pay and at least do a bit of research beforehand. AK says, unfortunately, some people think dyslexia is an easy disability to fake for the benefits. So that's why you need a valid source actually proving it. No, and that is true. And the people who think that are normally those who do not have it. Those who are dyslexic realize that on its own, it might not be debilitating. But when you combine it with all of life, other factors, scenarios and circumstances, it can have a really big impact. And on a day to day basis, it might not be that big. But when you have a lifetime of education, the end result can be quite significant between being a high achiever to someone who hasn't quite hit the marks that was expected of them. So I'm going to move on from this slide, but I know a lot of people normally have that question is, can you get it paid for? In my experience, not really, but if you're lucky, sometimes they do have funding, but unfortunately that funding isn't particularly consistent. If you are going to university, apply for the dis disabled student allowance before you receive a university offer. You do not have to wait until they give you a confirmed. If you have an unconditional, if you're applying to UCAS, get the ball rolling. It can take a while to come in. They can reject your application. Even if you think, I want to see how it goes. I might not even need the support. Very admirable of you, but honestly, not a good strategy. Apply for it sooner than later. Then you do, not, you do not have to tell your university, but it helps. So do you have to tell your university that you're dyslexic? No, you are not entitled to do that whatsoever. But when it comes to, say, the exams, when you need reasonable adjustments, and they say, well, you've never mentioned this before, do not be surprised if they do not give you the support. You have to build that kind of, repu I don't know about reputation, but you have to build that case that you are deserving and you would benefit. And as AK rightly said, people might not think, you're, they might think you're abusing the system. So up to you whether or not you tell, but honestly, there is a lot of benefits to telling. And if you do want an assessment, um, and again, it, they are paid services, but the ones that I'm familiar with is Lexic and British Dyslexia Association, the BDA, they can do assessments. So they're not the only ones. There's a lot of private individuals that can do them, but there are just some ones that we've used in the past. Most useful from a needs assessment. So which one of these do you think would have the biggest impact? Assistive technology, special tuition, note taking, extra time and exams. And this is in a university scenario. I know we asked this previously, but we are mainly talking about colleges. Ooh, assistive technology. Nice. I do find it's a lot easier to use assistive technology in university rather than in like school because it's more normalized. There's less of a stigma attached. So for me, yeah, I without my um, I use Dragon to like write. I don't think I would be able to be where I am today without it. 
assist technology in 2022. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it's getting, it's getting really good. So a few things that are good to know. If eligible for disability student allowance, student finance will contact you. Sometimes people just, they're like, I don't know how to do this. Student finance should contact you in theory. The assessment is very informal. It's nothing to be worried about. All they do is find out how your mind works, what would benefit you. It's important though, to talk about how you are like at your worst when you struggle. Try not to be all like, you know, I think just be honest. You do not have to pay for the assessment when it comes to at university. So when they are, when you are, when they are assessing whether or not you're eligible for support at university, that is free. Being diagnosed with dyslexia is not free. So if you're already diagnosed or you already have some form of proof, the cost of finding out whether or not you are eligible is free. And the support you receive depends on your needs, not your income. And this is a really good one. A university, when it comes to the amount of money you get and grants, it is often done on your means basis. So how much you make or parents make. That is not the case when it comes to DSA. It's more about what you would benefit, what you've had in the past, rather than anything relating to income. So you could be a millionaire and still apply for it. A bit unethical, but you could still do it. <laughs> and I'm only joking because it's not just about getting freebies and equipment. It's also about extra time. So study skills, some quick, fast tips on what you can do if you are dyslexic and in education, but might not necessarily have access to official support that's available. And I just wanna ask you, have there been any strategies in the past that have worked for you? Like things which you can easily do, aren't a big, you know, aren't gonna like reinvent the wheel, but can have a big impact. It seems a bit of a weird adjust strategy, but I always would have a doodle pad and I would just have a place where I can always do drawings because it kind of kept my mind busy. Another strategy, I'd sit at the front. Uh, I would record with a little dictaphone all the webinar seminars. I'll be honest with you, I never once listened to them back. But just knowing that I have a recording to like, in case I completely forget or zone out, I did find very helpful. Isolating, zone out. Yeah, finding a quiet space, finding a little nook. I would always find a little room in the university where there would be no one around and I can just relax, just be myself. So a few favorites that I've always found to be quite helpful is explaining the key concepts to someone. So however your mind works, talking to someone, letting them know you know, your lecturers aren't going to be dyslexic experts, but they cannot help if they do not know. It could, I've also liked making posters for important information like flashcards or like doing drawings to represent. Physically writing, I find to be quite useful as well. Sticky notes, where you will see them, I would put them all over my computer. The world has gotten incredibly digital, which is great, but sometimes having something physical that you can touch, rip off, screw up, tear down can be really helpful. Highlighting different passages and color coding, uh, reminders, all the basics. But if you have any other ones that you have found to be quite useful, open ears because you know there's no one sure way of helping. Now we briefly mentioned access to work. And if any of you are currently in the workplace, whether or not you're in the education field or not, get in touch with us because where at university it's, can be, it can be difficult to get support in the workplace. It's actually really easy, but less people know about it. So all you need is a job, you get an assessment, which is typically free, apply for the grant, and all the things you would typically get in university, you would also get in the workplace. So just because you've graduated, you're throwing your hat in the air, there is still support available. So if, if you are interested in learning a bit more about a workplace needs assessment, get in contact with us and we can let you know a bit more about that. But any final questions on dyslexia in education? It's been very much a whirlwind tour highlighting the top tips. But if there's anything else you'd like to know, let me know. 
Okay, we've got a question. Can your employer refuse to allow access to work to do an assessment? No. So the key thing, as always, is reasonable adjustments. They can refuse to implement some of the suggestions from access to work, but they cannot refuse for the assessment to take place. And the idea is the grant is to say that, why are you saying no? If it's to do with money, well, there's a grant available. If it's not to do with money, there are a few instances where they can say no to the adjustments. So for instance, basically if it crosses health and safety. So if, if whatever adjustment you have is interfering with the overall safety of other people, that's when they can say no. If that isn't the case, then you could go down the discrimination route. Try not to hit the nuclear button straight away, but no, they cannot refuse having an assessment because that would go against the Equality Act. They can refuse the adjustments that are offered, but they would have to need good reason to do so. Even if they have to contribute in any suggestion, well, this is why there's money available. The reasonable thing, so for instance, they can't, if it's part of the job and you need it to do the job, they have to pay. If it's something which is an additional extra, then they can kind of refuse to, but they would still be expected to find a reasonable solution to it. And if a physical example is, let's say you're in a wheelchair and you need a ramp to get into the build uh, in, to go upstairs or a lift. Now, they might not be able to afford a lift. Fair enough, they're expensive, but you can't just say you can't have this job, that maybe you can have a room downstairs where it is accessible. Now, a similar example can be used for dyslexia. As long as there's another alternative, then they might not have to implement it. If there's no other alternative and it's needed for accessibility, then they kind of have to. It's a gray area. We have a webinar coming up in the future, which is about dyslexia discrimination law and looking at real case examples. So it's quite difficult to give exact examples, but uh, in theory, no, they cannot discriminate and say no. In reality, maybe that's a little bit different. Well, I think the next webinar is the psychology of autism. And that is already way overbooked, which is great. And it's a really interesting one. We're, we're going to be looking at autism under the hood. So if you're interested, check out our Eventbrite or go on our website. But that will be a really interesting webinar as well, where we're going to be looking at why autistic people think the way they think. And can we even really ask that question? And if you thought, you know what, I'd love to get in contact with you guys. There's something I want to know more about. Get in contact with us. Our details are here. My name's been Nat, N-A-T, and you can just contact me at nat at accept.co.uk. Very interesting webinar. It should have more participants. Honestly, we normally have a good amount of participants, but I think maybe this subject, I don't know what about it. Yeah, dyslexia isn't as, uh, it's not as sexy as autism, but that doesn't mean that it isn't just as much as important that we should research it. So I'm so glad the ones who were able to attend were able to attend today. And thank you so much for coming. It's been great having you all.